our first two uh, scripture lessons come from uh, the Old Testament. First coming from Exodus chapter 12. Beginning with uh, verse 1 and going to, uh, to verse 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month, month is to be for you the first month. The first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor. Having, having taken into account the number of people there are, you are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be ear-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them in twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both human and animal. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike each of you. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. And from the prophet Jeremiah, Chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a, a master to them, declares the Lord. This is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. God. You'll now join with me in Psalm 116, if you find it in bulletin. I love the Lord who has heard my voice and my supplications and has inclined his ear to me whenever I call. The snares of death encompass me. I suffer distress and anguish. Then I call on the name of the Lord. O oh, Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought low, the Lord saved me. Return, O oh, my soul, to your rest. For the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from 
tears my feet from stone. I kept my faith even when I said I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, all demons are in What shall I return to the Lord for all my benefits? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows in the Lord, in the presence of all his people. In the course of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Now, some New Testament lessons uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses uh, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And from the Gospel of Mark, 14th chapter, verses 12 through 26. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, Where do you want us to go and, and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, Where is my guest room? Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, Jesus replied, one who dips the bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, 
and offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Again, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. An atheist hired an attorney to, uh, to bring a lawsuit, uh, a discrimina uh, discrimination, yeah, discrimination, I'll get it right, uh, case against Christians and Jews for their upcoming Easter and Passover holy days. <coughs> Sounds about right, doesn't it? Anymore? Uh, the lawyer argued that it was unfair because there is no holiday or, or special observance for atheists. Yes, there is, the judge replied, arguing that April 1st <laughs> is April Fool's Day. Psalm 14.1 declares, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Therefore, it is opinion of this court that your client is a fool, and April 1st is his day. And he then dismissed the case. Sadly, the only part I see happening uh, today in that whole thing is the original legal action. Um, the disciples were not fools, according to the psalmist. This definition and description of what a fool is. But I'm sure that by the time they left that upper room and went to the garden with Jesus, they were wondering. They were wondering if they were caught in the middle of some crazy and, and cruel joke. Let's put ourselves in their sandals. Although tonight you might not want to, it's a little chilly out there. Um, thought I was living in another time zone or something this morning when I got out. But anyway, let's put ourselves in their sandals. The night, this night, would have begun on a, a pretty high note for them. Here they were, gathering with Jesus to celebrate the high holy meal of the Passover, and they were in Jerusalem. This is a feast that remembers God's mercy shown to the Hebrew people. What a, a privilege for them to be with Jesus, the one they, they believed to be the Christ, the, the Messiah of God. And on such a, a holy day, what a blessing for them and, and, a, and a great time of celebration for them. And if anyone asked, which they did, what they were doing, 
They were to just say, the Lord did it. Everything had happened just as Jesus had said. What a day. As if things couldn't get any better, Jesus had, had gone to the temple that week too, and, and he had chased out all the, the money changers and the merchants. He told them, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. What, what a sight that was. What a sight that was. Table going everywhere, the money going everywhere, the, the sacrificial or sacrificial animals going everywhere. Oh my, what a sight. And again, it was right under the noses of those religious leaders that didn't like Jesus. You know, the disciples' excitement would have been building as they, they gathered, gathered together around that table in the upper room with Jesus, a, a place that had been found in much the same way as the donkey pole. Jesus sent Peter and John to make preparations, telling them, you're going to go into the city, you're going to find a man carrying a water jar. How random does that seem? You're to follow him and tell the owner of the house that he enters. The teacher asks, where is the guest room? Where is the upper room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? The owner leads them to this room without another word. And it, it all happened just like Jesus had said. So here they are, sitting around the table, waiting to share the Passover with Jesus, the Christ of God. This week, it just keeps getting better and better. They can hardly wait to see what happens next. Then the real craziness begins. Jesus wraps a towel around his waist. And he begins doing the disgusting task of washing their feet. A task that, that only the lowliest of people did because everybody's feet were walking through sewage everywhere in the streets. You know, we think people's feet smell after they take their shoes and socks off. Imagine those feet. The Messiah of God is washing their feet. And he tells them that, that he must wash their feet or they, they can have no part of him. And in talking with, with Peter, Jesus says that a clean person only needs to have their feet washed. And he, Jesus tells all of them that he has set an example for them. As if that wasn't crazy, confusing enough. Jesus continues on by saying that one of them, one of his disciples that are gathered around that table, one of them will betray him. This joke has taken a very cruel turn from the, the prediction of betrayal, even though at the time the disciples really had no idea just how cruel that betrayal would be. 
But the joke, the, the foolishness of that night continues, even increases. Jesus now, he now takes bread, blesses it, breaks it, and then gives it to them. before they can even begin to comprehend what Jesus has just done, he picks up the cup. He blesses it and he gives it to them. Telling them to take and drink. That this is his blood of the new covenant poured out for many forgiveness of sins. They are to do this in remembrance of him. Wow. How crazy. How crazy. Jesus is sitting right here with them and he's talking about remembering his body that was broken and his blood that was shed. Has he gone mad? He should not have been mocked or beaten. And the most foolish thing of all, their Messiah should not have been crucified. Jesus was God's holy one. God's Messiah. None of these things fit. Or did they? Or did they? I guess it all depends on whose Messiah we're talking about. The disciples were talking about their version of the Messiah. Someone that God would send to physically overthrow the Romans and establish God's kingdom on earth. This was going to be an earthly kingdom that would physically save them from the rule of Rome and any of their other enemies. But this earthly, kingly Messiah is not what God had in mind. God's Messiah would save them not by, by physically overthrowing their enemies, but by suffering and dying on the cross. Sounds like foolishness, doesn't it? A king suffering and, and dying for his people. Doesn't really sound like, like much of a king, at least not by our earthly standards. Yet it is exactly this foolishness of God that the disciples came face to face with on that night so long ago. That night they began to learn just how foolish God's wisdom is to humanity. As they went from 
the joy and excitement of celebrating the Passover feast with Jesus, the Messiah, in the holy city of Jerusalem, to from that high to the to being told to remember his his body and, and his broken body in the bread and, and his shed blood in the cup. They truly had to have wondered if they were caught up in some cruel joke. The reality that they gradually began to face that night is the same reality that we face today. A reality that the Apostle Paul states so very well in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 beginning with verse 18 and going to 25. Listen to these, these words. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise one? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. As we once more ponder the events of this Holy Week, may we have eyes to see more clearly the foolishness of God. May we see that it is wiser than any human wisdom. Even our own. Even our own. But God's foolishness, the message of the cross, is the power of God for those who believe. May we believe. And may we how be a fool for Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Sisters and brothers, Christ shows us his love by becoming a humble servant. Let us draw near to God and confess our sin and the truth of God's spirit. Let us spend a moment of silent confession.
Let us pray together. Most merciful God, we, your church, confess that often our spirit has not been that of Christ. Where we have failed to love one another as he loves us, where we have pledged loyalty to him with our lips and then betrayed, deserted, or denied him, forgive us, we pray. And by your spirit, make us faithful in every time of trial. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Hear these words of pardon. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. But Christ suffered and died for us, was raised from the dead and ascended on high for us and continued to intercede for us. Believe the good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Lift up our hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who with your word and Holy Spirit created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead this same Jesus, who now reigns with you in glory, and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take heed, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts, that in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of this Wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood until Christ comes in final direct victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As we've done in the past, we'll uh, go to in groups of 12 or around there to gather around the table and uh, receive much in a, as close as, as what it would have been for the disciples that night. And uh, I asked uh, Beth if she could handle the counting of 12, and she said she could. So. I'll leave that up to her to guide you. It is a socially distanced table.
There's a uh, song that I learned in college, I think, or it goes back a ways. Um, it was uh, written by Michael, written and performed by Michael Carr. And it's entitled God's Own Fool. And he bases it on this passage from 1 Corinthians. And um, he actually had, had people that uh, were angry with him and called into the radio shows and stuff that was playing that, is, that song. Because, How dare you talk about Jesus as God's own fool? Um, uh, and, and talk about God as foolish, you know. And, they totally, he says, no matter how I tried to explain it, they just didn't get it. Um, and I think there's a lot of that, a lot of that in our world that we need to keep, keep showing them God's wisdom by showing them God's love. Because as we share what the world calls foolishness, they will come to know the love of God just as we have come to know the love of God. And uh, as we share, humbly share, God's love with the world, their hearts will be changed. And that is the way God calls us to live. That's why Jesus came. That's why he suffered, that's why he died, and that's why he rose again. So may we, as we continue to journey to the cross and to the empty tomb, may our hearts be touched by the great love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ, and may we feel so blessed and humbled by that gift that we go out into the world and share. Let us go in God's peace and God's mercy and God's love. And all the children of God said, Amen. You're all welcome to uh, come to the Good Friday service tomorrow at 7. Still room for uh, lots of readers for anyone that would like to participate.